fellas, welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks so much for being here. Why don't y'all go ahead and introduce yourselves? Start with you, Todd. Todd for title. One third of the title brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Peace and blessings, everybody. Peace to you too, Sean. No, no, we're glad to be here, man. Yes. I'm Lance Furtado. I'm that middle part of the Furtado brothers. And which Furtado brother are we missing? Uh, so we're missing Tony, but you know, Tony is a broker. So he kind of does different things, but it works in unison with what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Y'all have one hell of a story. So thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your story. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this interview will enlighten and inspire some. And, um, be able to give back to the community. Why don't y'all talk about your upbringing? Where are you from? We'll start with you, Todd. <laughs> is, it, is it typically you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, we're from Harlem. We we were born in a hospital that um, that they said back in that time, what time? That time that only rich white people were born, in, which was named Flower Fifth Avenue. But in the earlier Pardon me, in the early 60s, we moved out to Queens, where we are, Southeast Jamaica, Queens. Okay, you said in the early 60s. No, I mean, that's what you what say? That what you say? That what you say? <laughs> in Harlem, it was totally different. See, Queens was the desert or the country. Mm -hmm. But in that time in Harlem, I remember as kids, like, we used to play. We used to play street ball, stick ball, roll tires around the corner. Like, we was kids. We literally had fun. We saw a lot of things that took place in Harlem in that era, but as kids, we had great fun. Yeah, you know, when you when you paint the um, picture, you know, that's the era, Malcolm X, you know, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, the Kennedys, John F. Kennedy, yeah. Robert F. Kennedy, you know, before those assassinations. And it was literally that concept that it takes a village a community, mm -hmm. a neighborhood to raise a child. And so in Harlem, and he, we laughed in the beginning because we've been in Queens all our life. So we're from Harlem, but I don't really claim it too much. You know, that's why he laughed because you asked yeah. him first. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just that, you know, we were brought up in that era, you know, of that, you know, strong family structure. You know, the mom and dad, everybody's present. Everybody sat at the dinner table together. You know, um, and there were, you know, family conversations. So it was just different eras, different times. Yeah. And then <clears throat> that's why I would have to claim Harlem. Because if it wasn't for Harlem, my father would have never my mother would have never met my mother. Queens would have never existed for us if it had not been for Harlem. Okay. What was the family dynamic like? Was it a two parent household? Was it, you know, your mom and dad both working, or was it just a single parent? So, uh, you know, um, ultimately it started off, you know, mom and dad household, right. you know, um, folks kind of look at me and my brothers now and they're kind of like, well, not now, but prior say, yeah. well, what, what the happened? hell happened? You know? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you know, because on my father's side of the family, they were all law enforcement. And on my mother's side of the family, they were all educators, you know, yeah. so they look at me and my brothers and go, you know, so yeah, it was definitely, you know, that traditional family structure, you know, and then my mom and dad kind of went through their turmoils, their up and downs, you know, um, but even when they separated, my dad was still in our life. Definitely. You know, he was still in our life. Okay, definitely. so this is not a traditional story where the dad wasn't in your life, you know, you, you were abused. You know. Oh, no. Really? No, no, but it's, it's the story of growing up in poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, definitely. definitely. Going. And so when you analyze back in those times, you know, law enforcement didn't get the, you know, they pay wasn't the type of money they make now. Mm -hmm. That pay was like, you know, minimum wage might have been 75 cent an hour or something. I don't yeah. know, you know, but it was just really. Don't tough. try to put the age with the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing with you. But yeah, so, <laughs> and, 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 you know, don't mind us because like, as we interview, like, it's going to be a lot of serious things okay. that we tap yeah. on. But one thing about us, man, you know, we like to have fun. We like to get our laugh on. But we want the viewers to know it's all right to get your laugh on. It's all right to have yeah. fun. But just know we ain't playing. And say so at the end of the day, you have to smile because it's only by the grace of God. 
Absolutely. Because we'd have been, we could have been in the multiplicity of places other than sitting right here, hanging out with you. We could have still been in somebody's house with a number. So it's poverty. We get it. Mm -hmm. Early 70s. Mm -hmm. Thank Everybody you. knows the Furtado brothers. Todd, Tony, Lance. Are there any Furtado sisters? Everybody know y'all because no. you were on the street. Are there any additional brothers? Nope, just us so three. So it's y'all three. Yes. Yeah. What's the order? Who's the oldest? Who's the youngest? So I, I, I'm the middle. You're the middle. Todd is the youngest. Tony, Tony, Lance, and Todd. You're being raised now. You're in Queens. Mm -hmm. Queens, for anybody who came up in New York, you thought of Queens as that's the burbs. That's where it is a lot nicer mm -hmm. than Harlem, yes. the Bronx, Brooklyn. How did, in the early days, how did y'all get in the street game? And how old were you? At the tender ages of 11, 12, and 13, we got involved with, you know, gangs, you know. And at the time, it was one of the biggest gangs in Queens that we were involved with. Not that gangs was new, because there were gangs in Harlem. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Getting but, in time. Right, different times. So in Queens, we got involved with gangs. And, you know, one thing escalated and led to the next. Well, before even y'all getting into gangs, mm -hmm. were y'all violent in any way? Not at all. Never? Not at all. Well, Still, like, listen, man, we love life. Mm -hmm. Not just our life. Everybody's. So we pro-life. You know what I'm saying? And in that game, in that life, we was known as the Robin Hood of the game. Because of so many people that we took care of and so many lives that we saved. So we was always lovers of life. It wasn't that we was violent, you know, but when you're growing up in an era that's different from, you know, and now we're experiencing almost the same thing, but racism was at an all time high back then. Mm -hmm. And it was out in the open. Yes. And like literally, you know, walking down the street, going from our house to go to the supermarket, the shop, it was on the other side of the bridge. And, you know, to be called a nigga or whatever was common. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. gangs were formed back then, you know, as a form of, of protection for a neighborhood, for a community, to protect, you know, the elderly and the adults and the parents in the community. Because racism was like at an all time high. The block that we grew up on in Queens, I describe every home on that block as, you know, a fully functional family. Each home on our block had a mom and a dad. So that meant they had dual income. Those kids in those homes had what they wanted. We didn't have what we needed, right? So we kind of took matters into our own hands, calling ourselves helping mom make ends meet, right? And at that time, uh, I made mention that we was involved then with one of the biggest gangs in Queens at the time. And, you know, back then, you know, of course, hair on, everything was like major. You had the Vietnam War going on, different things was going on. But we started selling weed. Back then, they called it marijuana, reefer, you know, um, but we started selling weed. Um, and it was under the mastermind of my brother, you know. Um, we had, honestly, I would say at least two to 300 of those gang members started selling weed for us. Lance, you also brought up that y'all joined one of the biggest gangs in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yes. You graduate, it's no longer the Saigons. Right. No, What's the name of the gang? Well, it, it actually, the name changed while we was in Westbury. Okay. So, you know, we, Saigons. And, uh, you know, so, you know, our cousins, we all, we didn't grow up like, like cousins. Mm -hmm. We grew up like brothers and sisters. Right. Right, so we used to call back to Queens because they were still living in Queens. And we was going like, yo, man, what's going on? You know, this and that. What's going on with the Saigons? Oh, we're not Saigons no more. We're all seven crowns. I said, oh, okay, I guess we're seven crowns now. <laughs> and so that's when the name changed for us out in Westbury. But then when we moved back to Queens and we came into contact with actual seven crowns, besides the name that we adopted, mm -hmm. that's when it began to change. Can y'all talk to me about the Seven Crowns and where did that name come from? Wow, so it actually, the Crowns was actually originated from the Bronx. Okay. Um, right. And the prayers of all Crowns was named Godfather. And um, the prayers of all Crowns and Queens was named Black. We called him Mr. Black, 
And um, he went to school with one of the brothers from out of the Bronx, Rosie, and he talked to Black about the crowns, and Black brought the crowns out to Queens. And it might have been 71, somewhere in that area. 70, 71. Yeah, and you know, and it just began to, you know, fester and grow from there. So the crowns got big real quick. Yeah, real quick. You know, there were some things that happened, some transformations. So I wouldn't say real quick, but about time 1974, 75 came around, mm -hmm. yeah, it was major. But you know what? The crowns only got big if the person who seemed to be in power realized that there's other gang members after me, mm -hmm. then the crowns was huge. But if you think that the gang didn't go beyond you, then maybe it was 20 crowns. But we know it, one, once upon a time, the crowns might have reached in the numbers of 1,000 to 1,500 strong. Easily. Because there's always powers and numbers. So it's impossible for you to be one of the most powerful gangs in New York and you don't have numbers. Impossible. Was it different segments of the crowns? Yes. Yeah. It was different divisions. segments. Yeah. There was divisions. different divisions. Yeah. What division were y'all a part of? Well, in the beginning stage, it was like the young crowns. Or you, they would say the baby, baby crowns. crowns. Okay. You know, so you had the young crowns, you had the little crowns, then you had the big crowns. And you had the royal crowns. The Royal Crowns was the females. Got you. Right. So it was, just, and then there were different divisions. Talk to me about the transition. I know you said y'all started out selling weed. Mm -hmm. Was it large shipments of weed? Was it nickel bags? Oh, no, no, how much course. were we doing? Back then, everything was, you know, tray bags, nickel bags. Um, the slogan in the vanilla. The envelope. slogan was joints and bags. That was the slogan back then. <laughs> right. And it was in, you know, you sold a yellow bag and a, a five dollar bag, a nickel bag, what they called it back then. You might have got 15 or 16 joints out of one bag. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of people would buy a bag, roll up joints and sell loose joints. You know, that was the hustle back then for kids, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how they made their money. That's how <coughs> folks made their money. But, you know, um, as I may mention, you know, the mastermind, my brother, right, you know, we might have been purchasing pounds, bagging it up, and then doling it out to individuals. And everybody made a certain amount of money off of each bag. And, and, and let me just say this before we get real further into the um, conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. Normally, Lance and I, we don't drop names mm -hmm. because, as Lance may mention, this thing called statute of limitations, yeah. so you don't know what someone did on their own. So for, I use myself, for me to say someone's name and God forbid if it strikes someone's psyche and mm -hmm. say, oh, that's, that's so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why we don't get into name dropping. But like last May mentioned about Mr. Black, we can say that name because that name is known all over the, all over Queens. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, we just, we touch on segments here and there. Gotcha. You know, but you know, that's the way it went. So it, it started off something small. You know, um, and it morphed into something. Okay, know? so before we talk about it morphing into something, your brother's the mastermind. He's the oldest. Y'all look up to him. We're all only one year apart. <laughs> only one year apart. <laughs> one year stair apart. steps. Stair yeah. step. One year gotcha. apart. <laughs> but there's truly the big brother aspect. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how old we are or not, there's the big brother aspect. Mm -hmm. Because it falls back to the family unit. Mm -hmm. When did y'all realize you had a knack for this? Or when did your older brother realize, okay, we dabbling in this drug thing, we're selling weed, but we got a real knack for this. We can turn this into something much bigger than it wasn't, a, it wasn't a knack or nothing like that. You know, it was just that, you know, we're trying to help mom make ends meet, you know, yeah. and when you got, you know, a lot of individuals selling weed or whatever for you, ends are starting to meet quickly, mm -hmm. you know. And no one never told us, you know, yo, stick with that. You know, don't, you know, graduate and start doing this. One person did tell us that, um, may you rest in peace, you know, brother named Skidbit. He was like, you know what, let's just everybody stay with this because once we graduate and start selling, 
heroin, coke, anything like that, then, you know, we're going to lose most of our crew to the drug, you know, to stick-ups, to prison, you know. He was the only one that kind of said something, but it didn't really register, you know. So it wasn't that we sat and, and had said, oh, we got to not, you know, yo, we know how to do this, you know, mm -hmm. we know how to take this and turn it into an enterprise. You know, we was just, everybody trying to eat, yeah. you know, and so you roll up and you're like, yo, what up, Sean, what's happening, man? Yo, man, listen, man. I hear y'all got that Acapulco gold, that Panamanian red. Those was the name of them back then. Like, listen, man, I'm trying to get on too, man. I'm trying to eat. You know what I'm saying? Come on, man, you can eat with us. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was, and this is just my thought. I don't think it was, and I'm just using the word think. But I don't think it was a goal set before us, like this is what we're gonna do. This is the what we're gonna achieve. Yeah. Things just fall in, fell into line. Yeah. It wasn't a five year plan. It just it just fell into line, like from one to another, to another, to another, it just fell in line. And then the people you were surrounded with just made it much easier. And then things start looking appealing. Then you may say, yo, I might be able to get a car six months from now. Then you, you know, you get out of the tunnel vision, but there was no master plan. No master plan at all. Like things just happened. So we talking early 70s, mid 70s now. Right? Crack is not big at this moment. It's not, it did, it didn't even, even it. exist. It didn't this even ain't exist. the 80s. Coke, listen. Back then, Coke was a rich man's high. That's it. Rich, no, a rich white man's high. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. you didn't even have too many people just sniffing Coke or whatever. You know, you, you know that was considered to be a rich man's high. Okay, so how did y'all transition from weed into Coke? And about what point did y'all transition? Yeah. So that didn't come to later, later on down the line, you know, because Heron was always, <clears throat> you know, in the, the preferred drug. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it, it probably went from marijuana to Heron. Okay, so you talk know. to me about that transition. I mean, it's just, you know, a transition, you know, one thing leading to another, you know, because things happen, you know. Do you got those little spurs of dry spell or whatever, you know, like, oh, we ain't, we ain't had no weed in about three months or whatever. It's dried up, whatever, this and that. We got to do something else to make money. I got a good one. You remember Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five? Yep. We're going to try something new. What you going to do? Try something else. Go for it yourself. And as Lance made mention, if T was the mastermind, which is the oldest, was the mastermind, what he did... We fell in suit with it because it was chances literally that he may have been taken that opened the door and saw daylight much faster than the average. And I'll say that humbly, much faster than the av yeah, average. Yeah, th things just kind of happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You no, know, it wasn't like some major plan. Sitting just, at the table like, yo, we're going to do this. And five we're years from that now. It just, it like just happened. Yeah, it just, it just happened. happened. I mean, and that's the way it usually happens yeah, on the streets, yeah. which, which we know. But you know what? The movies, and I'm glad the movies do mislead people mm -hmm. because there's no American dream in selling drugs. You don't get rich and get in the airplane like they did and super fly and fly off to never let. It's not reality. It's a recipe for disaster. And no kid, you know, comes home from school or graduate and says, you know, when you're growing up, you're saying, yo, I'm, I'm going to be a policeman. I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a doctor. You know, you got dreams like that. Nobody said, no, I'm going to be a drug dealer. and I'm going to be the best at it. And nobody yeah. said that, <laughs> you know. So just realistically, things ha happen accidentally, you know, but it still fell in line with just trying to make ends meet and help, you know, my mom. And so, you know, it morphed into something else. And, you know, ultimately what this one brother told us eventually happened. You know, we started losing a lot of our good friends, a lot of folks that came up with us in those ranks, you know, um, to the drug itself, mm -hmm. to prison. And I want to get there because that's always a byproduct of the game that people don't take into consideration mm -hmm. when they're starting out. They never, they never think of cause and effect. No, never. Right. never. You see the money start coming in, the lifestyle of women and you don't realize there's a lot of other things that come with this lifestyle. Oh, a lot of things. So before we get to that, you're making money with the weed. You graduate, you're moving on to the heroin. You're making a lot of money with the heroin. It's always ups and downs. Some, some say. 
Yeah, it's always up to that. <laughs> we'll just put it like that. It's just always up to that. Yeah, else. yeah. In, in, in any walk of life, like you got, it's like whatever life you're living, which consists of rules, codes, and procedures, you always you have to understand that the sun does not always shine. You may have a total eclipse, and only those who's cut from a certain cloth can recover from a total eclipse because total eclipse is total eclipse. Yeah, so it's, if that makes sense, yeah, it's, it's, mm, absolutely. It's, you, know, you know, there's ups and downs. So you ups know. and downs, and so that so the reason why sometimes like. We kind of talk in riddles and things of that mm -hmm. nature because we're not trying to give nobody a roadmap. So, you know, like I mentioned, this is a platform. Mm -hmm. and so we don't want to, you know, influence our future leaders, mm -hmm. our scholars. You know, we don't want to influence them the wrong way. So we don't want them to go, oh, shit, that's how they did it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we don't try to lay, a, you know, a map out there. Yeah. And so, you know, cats can look at it and they'd be watching, you know, oh, we watching Sean Perez. We got the Fatalo mm -hmm. brothers on it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you got it? You know, write it down, this and that. The, found, the foundation yeah, to not, destruction. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's an easy road to follow, especially in these day, this day and time. But at the end of the day, all of your listeners and your watchers, Klondike Cat always gets his mouth. Klondike Cat is a cartoon we grew up on. Klondike Cat, the cat was a Fed, federal agent. The mouse was named Savoir Fair. Savoir Fair is everywhere. He was the crook. Klondike Cat always got his mouth regardless. So what am I saying? Family, don't do it. Right, so we're we not necessarily, and you know, we understand there's a chynecological order, mm -hmm. but we're not going to give a roadmap. And that's fine. We're not, we're not gonna I'm more roadmap. interested yeah. in the story. That, that, that to me. So I have no problem. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and what Lance is saying, the story is a very intriguing story. Mm -hmm. But if we sit down and tell a story without missing a beat, it's a roadmap. Mm. Yeah. And so, you know. It, it really is a roadmap. I may mention to you that we lovers of life. Mm -hmm. And so we had a little knowledge about things because we were came from a family of law enforcement and educators. Mm -hmm. So we knew a little bit about state law, but we didn't know about federal law. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so we do understand, you know, what we describe today as a form of modern day slavery. And that's that prison industrial complex. So we're not gonna paint a picture to drive people down that road. You know, we made our choices knowingly and willingly, mm -hmm. and we live with whatever choice we made. With that being said, our soul is intact. And for the viewers, they know what that means. There's no yeah. compromising in us. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? And, and that's one of the reasons why I said, we really not gonna name drop because there's snitching and then there's dry snitching. Mm -hmm. So when you're speaking on something that took place that um, played a major role in a lot of people's lives, really not knowing what a person did out of your sight and you start speaking their name, you're kind of putting them out there. And, the, and, and don't get me wrong, <clears throat> because the platform that we're on, a lot of people do get a little upset because we don't speak their names. Like, we don't speak your name because we love you. We don't mm -hmm. speak your name because something, you may have a, a skeleton in the closet. And maybe by us speaking your name and paying homage, the skeleton may fall out and it all fall back us. And at the end of the day, no one's getting hurt on our watch. So, that's yeah, fair. We, we, we're not going to give a roadmap, you know. Okay, and, 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 and that's and fair. We, listen, oh, we got the utmost respect for your platform, your show, and Sean Perez himself, you know what I'm saying? Black, black TV, nothing but love. But we're not going to give a roadmap. Fair enough. And, and if, Cause if, we don't want nobody's blood on our hands. And it's 100% understandable, especially what your mission is today. Yes. So in, in, we'll construct the interview exactly as you, as you guys want it in the sense of this is a cautionary tale. If anything, it's something learn from us, but don't go this way. It's definitely learn from us, learn from us, from our mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, Allow our mistakes to, you know, uplift you. Um, Into which it should. Right. Into which it should. But you know what? Just to be fair, Lance and I have heard many occasions people say, yo, with the money y'all had, I could do 15, 20 years. 
Okay, so 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 crazy. let's let, let's stop there for a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounds crazy. I, I, I want to talk about when money enters the game, mm -hmm. right? When money enters the game, y'all are down with the seven crowns. Mm -hmm. When the type of money that you go from weed to now heroin stuff. The, the seven crowns get, it's big. It's well respected. Yeah, but so <clears throat> we don't want to misconstrue it because mm -hmm. us making decisions we made and the money we was making mm -hmm. had nothing to do with the seven crowns. Mm. That was the Furtado brothers. You know, so it didn't really have Can you much elaborate on that? So in other words, you know, it wasn't that the gang itself, the seven crowns, was into this, you know, uh, criminal enterprise. No, we was just a gang. You know what I'm saying? And everybody in that gang, you know, made their own decisions. I mean, we had a, you know, a core, you know, platform that we followed as far as what was our rules, codes, and procedures and things that, the lines that we didn't step over, you know. But, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to get your money, you know. So everybody hustled the way they hustled. You know, yeah, and that's you have so many different variations to hustle it. You know, you know what I'm saying. From Joshua's, that's pickpockets. You know, from people that's going out and stealing clothes, people that are, you know, going to the airport and stealing whole freight full of furniture. You know, everybody had different hustles. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you put it, because within the crew, there was not one big hustle. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. It like was that. individuals that did their own thing. And if and if we need to, we'll come together mm -hmm. to if there's a problem, we'll come together and speak about it. But as far as that life, it was, you know, spread it out. It was not a big Right. It wasn't a gang decision. No. Nah. Got you. Right. So I just wanted to, you know, so clarify so it does not misconstrued. No, it wasn't that, you know, this is the direction that the seven crowns was going in. Yeah. No. And no. then and then it's more than safe to say. Everyone that was a was a crown didn't sell drugs. Everyone exactly. that was a crown did not use drugs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Everyone that was a crown might have drunk some wild Irish rose. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, so, so it was limitation to everything. You know, what you did is what you did. How much weight were y'all moving in the 70s before? We get into the crack era, and just is it? We never saw. So when you keep saying before the crack era, we was never involved with crack. Never involved. Never. In crack. So heroin, cocaine. Yeah. I have to tell the how truth. much were we moving and Hold how much money? <clears throat> Go ahead. Who you thought? We were never in the crack era, mm -hmm. but me, you know, how they say curiosity killed the cat. Mm -hmm. I sold crack one day and went to jail because <laughs> I had no business selling crack. I went against the grain. The family's grain. Mm -hmm. I went against the grain and I went to jail. So, so, and just to bring it into the context of the question, right? Mm -hmm. that, that question can only be answered from our indictment, right? Because okay. that's public information, yeah. okay. right? So, we was charged with three thousand keys of coke and two hundred keys of heroin every Did six all months. Three of all three y'all have the we same all charges? We, we all yeah. were charged. Okay. Conspiracy. Okay. So, and, you know, we'll talk about that later as we get into, you know, different laws and what conspiracy is, you know, so people will know what to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, but so, in that indictment, we was charged with 3,000 keys of coke, 200 keys of heroin every six months. And so, they said that went on for years. That's what they say. Okay, what do you say? We say that's what they, they say. say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> according to what they say, how much money is that every six months? According to what it, they uh, say. According to what they say? Oh, man, they would say that was $50 million every six months. Yeah. That's and, what they would and, say. And, the, and their statement was after everyone all got paid, like we might have settled down with ourselves like 750000 yeah. No, 750 million, pardon me. Yeah, they, they make up numbers. So, <clears throat> yeah. And, that, you know, we made a joke, like, we did a, um, so we're motivational, inspirational speakers, mm -hmm. right? And so we had this um, this engagement in Dallas, Texas, and it was to the Billionaires Club, right? And we were talking to them, you know, and showing the resemblance, you know, and we was talking about them, you know, um, and their structure, mm -hmm. you know, 
you know, president, vice president, you know, you had executive director, you had secretaries, you had treasurers, you know, you had accountants and you had different things. And so we showed our structure, except we just used military from generals to captains to lieutenants. And then when we got down to the accountants, we said, yeah, we had accountants too. They just happened to be the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they make up their own numbers, <laughs> you know. But once upon a time, you know, yeah, we was rich once upon a time. You know, if people want to say, yeah, once upon a time we was millionaires. Yeah. Once upon a time we owned 17 pieces of prime real estate, commercial and residential. We did whatever we wanted to whenever we wanted to. You know, if we wanted to wake up one day and fly to Miami just to buy some weed and come back, the same, that's what we did. Oh, if we woke up one day and wanted to take 40 people to the Holy, holy Field and British Bowl fight, that's what we did. It was actually 62 people. My bad. <laughs> so, you know, but that was, yeah. you know, different times, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was worth it. You know, if you had to analyze, you know, as Todd just said, you know, certain cats would go, yo, man, you know, I'll put my neck on the line for 15 years of my life. You know, if I could make five, six million dollars and I had to do 15 years, yo, I can do it. It's not that type of money in the streets no more. Never ever will it be there like that again. You know, so it was different times, different eras. And we took different, you know, different choice. We made different choices and we took different chances. And that's why I mentioned earlier that we made our choices knowingly and willingly. Yeah. And, 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 and even saying that, right, even on today, we are so mindful that the lives got destroyed from the usage of a drug. Whether it was using it personally or selling it. A lot of people, families, and, and so on got destroyed. Communities, you know, villages got tore apart because the, the head of the village was addicted mm -hmm. to something other than his family, which was his true calling, being a, a God-given father. He was addicted to a controlled substance. So he was in the straight, made, pardon me, in the, right straight of, in the right frame of mind. So if he's not in the right frame of mind, how could he pour any substance into his child, be it male or female? He can't because his mind is elsewhere. So um, everybody, you know, wants to be respected. Everybody wants to feel, you know, that I am somebody. And, and individually, everybody's important. Yes. And everybody has their own individuality, and they are somebody. You know, just unfortunately, you ain't the somebody you used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what happens, you know, in life. And so, just to bring a full circle, you know, part of this, you know, whole interview is just to motivate, educate, uplift, and inspire our future leaders to be all they can be, despite the elements that continuously surround them. Because that's the same shit we came up in. It's just different. You know, mm -hmm. it's different levels yeah. now. You know what I'm saying? But we're not going to put a battery pack in somebody's back and say, yo, you could do that. Go do that. Yeah. Now, if we put a battery pack in your back, we're saying, yo, you can be the best positive role model you can be. Right? You could be the best entrepreneur, not street entrepreneur. Yo, you know, it was told to us that, you know, the type of business that we were in, the type of business that we ran, we could have easily ran a Fortune 500. And it's facts. And so one thing about us, right, we're not braggadacious, nothing like that. You know, we're humbled, we're low-keyed, we're modest, right? But we grew up on, you know, this Western that used to come on. It was called the Guns of Will Sonic. And it was about this old man he was the fastest gun in the West. And, you know, cats used to come out and challenge him, young cats, whatever. And when they see him, they used to look at him and go, this old man, he's the fastest gun, in, you know, in the world. Like, and he had one saying he used to say, it's no brags, just facts. And that's how it is with us. It's no brags, <clears throat> it's just facts. Exactly. So can I ask y'all this? You know, according to the feds, mm -hmm. Going to the prosecutors, mm -hmm. you're making hundreds of millions of dollars. According to you guys, you're feeding upwards of 500 families, mm -hmm. not individuals, families. Mm -hmm. But that amount of influence, it will naturally breed envy, jealousy, 
And we, it will have people coming and trying to take your spot. Certainly. So can we talk without saying any, how bad did it get in so, terms of street wars, in terms of people trying to come and get your spot? So ironically, right, it's, you know, and it's hard to believe because we started off earlier with this interview letting you know how loved we were, mm -hmm. right, and still are, mm -hmm. right? Um, everybody ate with us. So you didn't have a chance to be envious or jealous because we gave you that chance. You know what I'm saying? If you came and said, yo, man, I, I'm gonna eat too. All right, let's see what you made out of. And you get that chance. Now, if you, excuse my French, fucked that up, you did that. You know what I'm saying? And so, and let me just say this, because I, you know, sometimes I use language because I need the people to feel what we're saying, right? But don't get it misconstrued. We're both born again Christians. We love the Lord. That's what we serve. But I'm just a little different, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I use language sometimes because I need you to feel where I'm coming from, you know? And so, of course, there was envious, there was jealousy, you know, but it was mumbled. You know what I mean? It was mumbled because when you well loved, right? And I used to ask, like, when we go into schools and we're talking to kids, and I ask, these, and I ask our scholars, I ask our participants, I said, let me ask you a question. Who has the most power? The one with the most money, the one that's feared, or the one that's loved? Who has the most power? The one that's loved has the most power. Because you could have the most money, and you could be talking to somebody that loves us, right? And you could be talking about wanting to do us dirty. And you got somebody that's going to play along just to get that bag from you and then do you dirty. Love overpowers everything. So, of course, there were people that were envious, you know, and jealous. But we loved everybody. And we gave everybody a fair shake. And when you analyze yourself, and you sit back, and you be sitting there, and you be like, man, you mad, and you, you finding the reason to, you know, amp yourself up and say, man, you jealous, you envious, like, why they this, and why this and that? And then, eventually, you come back to yourself and say, well, damn, it gave me a chance to make millions of dollars, and I fucked it up. The organization grew. It was multi-state, correct? Yeah, that wasn't the organization. Okay, the Furtado brothers yeah. grew. Yeah. Within y'all's organization, mm -hmm. it became multi-state? I mean, the, the, the government would say 23 states. Would the Furtado brothers say different? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Speaking of internationals, I read that the Furtado brothers, not the, 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 the gang, had ties to Colombia. Meaning Medellin, yeah. Colombia. You read that? I read it. That's what they said. Okay. So what they're saying <laughs> is that, <laughs> was there ever a time, whether it be for business or personal, that any of the brothers had to take a trip out to Colombia? Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say I can't stamp that. So, well, what I will say for the viewers, mm -hmm. your 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 audience, mm -hmm. you know, those hot boys come in all shapes, forms, and sizes, and they come in the form of connects also too, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing about the potatoes is there might be one or two people that can say we work for them, but we never work for nobody. Mm and we never took no consignment, right? So, and this is one of the reasons like that we will never ever go back to that because we are lovers of life and you don't know who to trust in that game no more. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Cash used to be like, yo, introduce me. I'm not introducing nobody to nobody because God forbid that person I introduce you to, even though you think he might be up here, end up being the one to bury you. There you go. And he said, well, Lance so, introduced me. Can, can, can I ask about this? No. Let's just say introduced. Use that word. Mm -hmm. Were any of y'all ever introduced to Pablo Escobar? No. no. Never? No. Okay. No. So, but you did, well, the business of pleasure, make your way out to Colombia. Because it made its way here. Understood. Understood 100%. 
I want to I want to skip a little bit. Sure. Because we didn't fall on Plymouth Rock. <laughs> Plymouth Rock. <laughs> and I'm sure if, if if we can't go here, it's fine. Queens is also known for some other legendary figures. Of course. In in the street game. Yeah. One I'll, being I'll use the term. Go ahead. Fat cat. Family. 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 That's all I'll say. To this day. day. To this day. Underdulturated love. How do y'all know him? Is, is it from the block? Is it from being in the we gang? We grew up together, from the gangs, all that. The yeah. block, we grew up together. His kids is our nephews, our kids is his nephews. Yeah, family. That's just, like Todd said, family. Family. You know, we all, we all go through our trials and tribulations and live in that life. We do things that society see that's totally off the wall, but... And, and I'm not condoning anything, see, but when you live in a life like that, there's certain things that go along with that life. And sometimes some people just lived it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, cat is family. And people just don't know, right? And, you know, everybody has their own mind made up about, you know, the way they describe the person. But if you really knew him, you would say, damn, this is a good dude. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and and you know, I gotta ask this. It, it's alleged, or it's accused, it's public knowledge mm -hmm. that he ordered a hit on a New York City police officer. Not at all. That was something you know, <coughs> as we learned down the years, that was spontaneously done. Can was you elaborate on that? What does that mean? No, it means that somebody took matters into their own hands. It wasn't no order from. It was never an order. Never an order. You know, to I'm, our knowledge, never order. Never order. You remember I said, <clears throat> um, no, we're going to go ahead. Come yeah, not, not, yeah, because the, 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 the assassination, we'll call it, yeah, which it that, was. That's what they call of, it. Of New York City police officer Edward Byrne, mm -hmm. yeah. it changed everything in New York. Changed it game. changed the game. Changed completely. The game. You yeah. can go to that moment in time. It changed. It, it the started world. the TNT task force around the world. When when then um, President Bush Senior was running for office, mm -hmm. he ran with the president. I mean, he ran with um, Ed Burns' badge in his hand, mm -hmm. talking about his war on drugs. So it changed not just for Queens, for everybody. <clears throat> yeah, everywhere. Can't didn't that order that? Hmm. Not, at, not at all. Not okay, at all. let's switch for a second. Go ahead. Supreme family. family to this day. To, to this day. day. Hmm. Notice we didn't stutter. No, not at all. So it's never any internal beef. Never. L O V E. Never. Hmm. So everybody, because these are major names, y'all names, Fat Cat, Preen, all known for Queens, mm -hmm. coming out of Queens, mm -hmm. all work together in somewhat harmony that both of y'all could say at the same time, in sync, family. Absolutely. So I, I'll put it to you like this, because a, a lot of people ask, where did the name or the title King of Kings come from? Mm -hmm. It's not a name or a title we gave ourselves. Um, when you analyze some of those names that you said and some that you didn't mention, mm -hmm. All of those people are kings in their own right. We just happen to be the king of kings. So that's where it came from. It's not a name or a title we gave ourselves. And that's a subliminal message, but you could put that together. Do you think if they were sitting in this seat, mm -hmm. they would, number one, acknowledge the same love? Without and number two, Absolutely. without a doubt. Without a doubt. Without but a doubt. With, with number two, would they acknowledge, look, we're kings, but the Fatados was a little different. Without a That's doubt. King well, of I'm, Kings. I'm, that I'm, name was not just given to them. It was an earned title. Without a doubt. Yeah. Okay. Listen, so that's I, why I, I started believe off. So. I that's, believe so. That's why I started off saying anything about us, it's no brags. It's just facts. Mm -hmm. And for anybody to try to distort that, discredit it in any shape, form, or fashion, will be discrediting themselves. Can I ask, at your height? Five, five, five ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm playing. I'm at sorry. your height, <laughs> what was the largest purchase, if you can speak on it, that you ever made? I don't we know. just said what the government thinks. So the government said that we was doing 3,000 keys every 
six months and 200 keys of heroin. And I just said to you, we <coughs> never took no consignment from nobody. Never took no, okay. Was any of that ever ripped off? Was any of that ever lost in the street? I know you oh, all no, shit love, but then, oh, no, okay. stuff Can happened. We, okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you take losses. There's ups and downs, but yeah. one thing about us, we never cried about a loss. We can take a million, two million dollar loss, but you would never know it. This is what we said back of that day, which was a crazy statement. We're part of the good hands people. Once you get with the Fatani brothers, you'll never go wrong. So if you get with us and you have a pure heart, you have the opportunity to gain wealth beyond imagination. If you put the banana pill in front of yourself and slip and fall, we're not gonna let you bust your head because we're traveling in love, but no more banana pills. You didn't yeah, use a banana pill on our watch again. But losses happen. It happens. Losses happen. Yeah, it's both both on the street side and police seizures. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, just, yeah. y'all chalked it up as part of that's the game. Part of the Let's game. keep moving. Well, that's part well, of the game. Well, in reality, it have to be. It's, nobody never took nothing from us. I'll put that out there. Nobody and, that you know. No, yeah, no. Nobody never took nothing. That's different. Messing up and taking. So, you, you know, you got some people, not to cut Todd off, and excuse my French, but you got some people that are just fuck ups. Mm -hmm. You know? And as you move along, you learn, like, no, nah, I can't give you nothing no more. You're a fuck up. You know what I'm saying? That's not taking nothing. You just didn't have the, the, you know, the managerial skills or whatever it took or needed that you thought you had to run a business. To make it grow. And it crumbled. And we're not saying that as a blueprint for anyone that's listening and saying, hey, well, you know what? You may be last long in this game if you do X, Y, and Z. There's no right way to do wrong. At the end of the day, the federal government always get their man instead of clowning that cat. They always get their man. Make no mistakes. And so what I would say to like just, you know, elaborate on that a little further, right? Because I know cats, you know, sitting here and hearing us talking and, you know, some younger generation, I mean, say, oh, hey, them, them niggas scared. Hell no. Ain't nothing scared about the photographer. Alice ain't raised no punks, period, right? Um, but I say it to you like this. Most people, 90% of the folks that was in this life, this game, had a three-year run, right? And then they spent the next 25 years of their life reminiscing. Mm -hmm. Or they're still in prison reminiscing. Yo, remember what we used to do? Yo, remember we brought that 500? Remember we did this? We had a 25-plus year run. On the streets. On the streets. Free men. Free men. And still here to talk about it. In sound mind and good spirit. And again, our soul is intact. Okay, so, so let's go there. How did you have a 25-year run distributing the type of product you would see? Those are big numbers. Because most we, people don't get nearly to see those types of numbers. We knew how to get ghosts. So we wasn't that caught up into so it. So you was never flashy. No. Oh, no. We had, we, no, listen, we had all of the, you know, amenities that went along with it, the Porsches and this and that and that and this and the diamonds and all that. But no, we wasn't flashy. We wasn't a sore thumb we never told on ourselves. Understood. Self-inflection is, is, is the, is the um, destruction to the uh, man's. So, so how did y'all manage to keep it so low? When so many of the, you know, everybody knows Prem. Because we knew how to get goats. So when, when, when the heat was on, we knew how to shut down and leave town. And we'd be gone for a year or two. So we, we knew how to close it up. And when we did that, we gave everybody else longevity. Can we talk about the discipline? Because I think that that's one of the things that brings most people down. Number one, they tell on themselves, Mm -hmm. Not through their mouth, but through the lifestyle. Through their ways and actions. Exactly. But most people don't have the discipline to do exactly what you just said, Lance, mm -hmm. is to shut it down. It's, it comes from the motive. Go ahead. Why you're doing what you're doing. What's your motivation? <clears throat> like we made mentions, you have some people even to this day to say, yo, they have anything what, they, what the government say they had. I'll put my life on the line for 25 years so you have people with that mentality. Remember, we started out even selling joints because we wouldn't dare ask my mother for no money. Mm -hmm. She's paying all the bills. 
We in a single family home. So our motivation to sell drugs was not to get rich. It just happened. And I know, and I know that may sound like some corny stuff, but it just happened. Like that wasn't our goal. We didn't start to say, yo, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this to our kid, to the best of our ability and we're gonna ride, we're gonna be so-and-so in this game. No. So, and to you know, give more clarity to the question that was asked, right? Discipline. It takes discipline. So, as I made mention to you earlier, we are always humbled, low-keyed, modest. We wasn't about. But that's hard to flame. be You're when right. you are the H N I C, and 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 that's what what I'm asking because the book stopped with y'all. Y'all made it clear. Yeah. We didn't have no bosses. We, we was worked. a myth. We was a myth to a lot of people. <clears throat> Yeah. Like some people would say we were by appointment only, you know, like the only way you could see one of us was by appointment. And That's what, what folks used to say. If, if you ever had the opportunity to watch the King of Kings documentary or the trailer, you would hear Fred Joe Starr say, I always heard about him. No, I watched I've the documentary. Seen, I've yeah. never seen him. Yep. I'm I very clear. Him. I'm very clear on it. So that's the way it was. We didn't like, don't get us wrong. Like. We had the Porsches, we had all that, Benzes. At one time, we might have had eight, nine Benzes, you know, but those wasn't everyday cars for us. Like, if we was going out, we was going to Atlantic City, we going out, you know, then we break out a car, we go out. But just to be in the community every day, driving the Porsche, doing this and that, no, you asking for trouble. And okay, what did you drive every day? What was your everyday car? So, my everyday car, I had, I had like a few of them. Like, my, my box of bill was my baby. Back, like we going back to the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, we always, all of us always had like seven or eight cars. Mm -hmm. My Boxerville and my Oldsmobile 98, those are my babies. You know what I'm saying? You know, my Porsches and BMs, I used to keep those parked and I drove my Chrysler Laser. That's what I drove, you know? I mean, it had work in it, you know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> you just ain't gonna run down on me because I can get ghosts, mm -hmm. you know? I drove around in a big, blue van, right, that had a Godzilla bite taken out the side of it. But the engine work, the training work, and everything that was in it would <coughs> get ghost. And 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 <laughs> and know? I I, I kind of see what you're saying, but by no means are we saying there wasn't trials and tribulations. They tried to kidnap my family. Can we talk about that? It's really not a lot to go into. Mm -hmm. Stick up kid tried to catch my son and my wife going in my, my then wife going into the house, but my brother remembered the description I gave them at the car they was driving. So when he dropped them off and pulled off, he saw the car coming, he backed up, snatched him, and whatever happened after that happened after that. But things like that did happen, see, but for the most part, we were loved. And then when you think about how deep and strong the love factor is, more than likely, it was someone who we loved that put the stick of kids on me. Mm -hmm. That happens. It go with the territory, and you know, it's as they say, it's part of the game. But it's only by the grace of God, and I can say that with a clear conscience. It's only by the grace of God that we didn't fall into any of the snares and traps that a lot of other people fell on or fell into. We didn't abuse the game, as far as we think. Because as last we mentioned, we caught ourselves or other people caught us the Robin Hood of the game. But that was in my feeble mind way of thinking. But as today, I'll be the first to tell you, we were so dead wrong, we should have blew hell wide open. It wouldn't have been the air conditioning up bigger or a stitching cord long enough to cool our behinds off in hell. But God had a purpose and a plan for us. Before, before we close this out, uh, there's a couple of points I want to get to because mm -hmm. I do want to get to the downfall mm -hmm. when you got locked up. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere, and, and y'all said y'all had uh, law enforcement in your family. Mm -hmm. Number one, without naming names, law enforcement, like you said earlier, they're making minimum wage at the time. Mm -hmm. Minimum <coughs> wage Today it's very you can barely live off it. Exactly. So back then they're really making almost no money. Did any of these law enforcement, whether it be in your family or friends of the family, ever get recruited into what you were doing and help to keep y'all low and to feed you information? 
I plead, no. the, I plead the fifth. No, but does the answer that <laughs> to feed us information? No, no, no. no. Okay, no. so so so, so how about a, just being there, involved? There was recruitment. Okay, but to feed information and stuff like that. No, no. Okay, so what what was their role? Just to make money. Listen, they was in it in the game also. Like, listen, while wearing the badge. Let me get this to you. Go ahead. We was in a jail called 1400 Hilgo Street, Columbia, South Carolina. Every top brass officer was on our payroll. I was, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. How, what year did the feds start closing in? And how did y'all go down? So, the, the, actually... Hey, we was always the on the radar since 1979. We was always on the radar. That's why I said we, we knew how to shut it down. You know, we would take a three, four-year run and then shut down for a year or two. So you got to realize every six months you need something new to keep the investigation going. Mm -hmm. Every six months. If you get nothing new in the first six months, you have to shut it down. Okay, you didn't know that at the time. Is this where the law enforcement <laughs> no. side helped y'all? No, it was just, I think. You know what? That's a good question, but this is just that's just how we move. So, so remember so, who you thought. Yeah. Remember he remember what he said in the beginning? Our older brother mm -hmm. was a mastermind. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe he knew. I don't know. Maybe he knew. Yeah, it, it was just, you know, you know how you have that gut feeling, that mm -hmm. instinct. Don't turn left, turn right. Or, you know, like, could we drove with our eyes in the mirror and you know when you're being followed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all right, this is two days in a row. Something ain't right. You know? So you telling me at the height, it's so much money coming in. Mm -hmm. You see the same card following you mm -hmm. two days in a row. Mm -hmm. And you have the discipline. We're talking about three individuals. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about one in... Charge, you say, hey, Lance, we need to shut it down. And Lance is like, no, I didn't see no car in the mirror. Or y'all tell your older brother, Tony, look, we got some heat on us. And he's like, I, I don't see nothing. You're telling me y'all had the discipline mm -hmm. to shut it down in real time and convince the other two brothers to do the same. Because it's that's not well, common. You know it wasn't even a convention. Yeah, it wasn't a convention. It's just what takes place is what takes place. There's no, hey, yo, no, you got to do this here. Yo, we shutting down. Okay. Yeah, we didn't come We didn't come and say, hey, Sean, what you think? We said, hey, Sean, we're shutting down. That's, that's it. it. Wow. So, that's notice, it. notice we said that together, mm -hmm. right? With no stuttering. That's it. That's just how we move. It was shut down. Okay, Why? so how, how did y'all get locked up? And, 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 where, <laughs> and, where, and where were y'all at? So... <laughs> We were in, right, so when we just say collectively, mm -hmm. it was 32 of us all together that got locked up, and we might have been in nine different states, right? And it starts from a connect, someone that you think or feel is, you know, but it starts from a connect. You know, somebody that got access to a thousand keys, whatever, and they the, you know, the ones. And, you know, it trickles down to someone not paying attention and not listening, and then they get jammed up, right? And then that individual is not as strong as you thought he was. You know, it can't hold water like you thought he could, right? And then he puts the assumption out there, and then a surveillance and investigation takes place with wiretaps, all type of stuff. And so... That ha that's actually been going on since 79, wiretaps, this and that, you know, because our first case happened in, I want to say, 1980, 81, when I was facing then an A1 conspiracy, and I was facing 25 to life, right? And it took us three years to beat that case because the evidence was really some made-up shit for real, like, like for real, some made-up stuff, you know? But that's just the way the government plays, mm -hmm. but right? But all it takes is, you know... The government, and when you're messing with the Alphabet City, they know how to scare the bejesus out of somebody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when they scare the shit out of somebody, that's somebody who you thought, as long as they're around you, they're strong. You know what I'm saying? But as soon as you get them off by themselves, they tell on the world. 
And so that's what kind of had, you know, happened. And and if, and if, and if you read the, it was in the Daily, or one of the news, New York Times or Daily News, it kind of laid it out. You know what I mean? So, you know. But our audience might not know. Snitches. That's why, snitches. Yeah, okay. play. <clears throat> snitches. So snitches brought y'all down. Oh, they would have never got us. Okay. So so were these snitches people who you knew, loved, worked with, yep. never thought, yep. a day, this, he's strong. He going to hold his own. Yep. I'm going to play basketball with you. What's my last name? Me? Yes. Furtado. One of the snitches carried that last name, but it definitely wasn't a brother. So when a family member gave suggestions that this is what's going on, the family member is more easy to believe mm -hmm. than a hundred other people that say, no, you got to be out your mind. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. Because of the pressure. Because mm -hmm. of the pressure that, you know, face here with 2,000 years. And if they can give to you, they give it to you. <clears throat> See, but my, I have mixed emotions about that. Because I'll sit here and honestly say, I wouldn't care what situation it is. If I'm on that boat, I'm taking the boat down and I'm going down by myself. I'm going to throw you a lifeline. I'm not going to throw you a line with no life support on it. You grab me for the life support and there's no support, so you're going to sink with me. That's not happening, but that's what happened. Okay, you knew the game y'all was in. Mm -hmm. Each one individually. I got to believe that y'all had conversations amongst yourselves before everything came crumbling down. Was each one of y'all willing to go down solo, even if it meant spending the rest of your life behind bars? Of course. That was a decision you made. <clears throat> was it, is there something that's invented in us? That's the cloth that we cut from. I, this is what, I don't speak this a lot. Mm -hmm. Charleston County, South Carolina, County Jail. Just district attorney came to me and said, hey, you give me a Colombian or African connection, African connection, you go home right now. I said, I lived by the sword, I'll die by the sword. And that was that. Okay, a lot of people say that, and they come back another time. And they come well, back a third time. Pressure didn't bust the pipe. Exactly. So that's when we say real recognizes real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And real men do real things, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people talk that shit. <clears throat> and then I don't care how old your case is, our case made precedent, which is in um, book, f what is it? Book 191, page 420, third reporter of the Fed's law book. If any of us told on anybody, trust me, it, it would, would be, be in, in that book. Mm -hmm. It would be in there. So for, and, and you know, anything we did set, set precedents, you know, so for anybody that needs help, you know, um, getting reductions on their supervised release issues or whatever, they can go to, as Todd made mention, is Third Reporter, Third Reporter, Book 191, page 420, and you can read about Fatalos versus U.S. Yeah. We, okay. showed, we showed what is called the keys to justice. Got you. How much time did you ultimately, in what year were y'all busted? 95. 95, all three? 95. Nationwide sweep. Okay, 32 of y'all go in. How much time did you get, Todd? How much time did you get, Lance? How much time did your older brother, Tony, get? Mm -hmm. So, Tony got 22, he got 222 months. I got 188 months. 97. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> That's what feds give you. They don't give I, you years. Okay, you can more. you take, speak in my language? How many <laughs> years is that? How many I years got, is that? I got sentenced to seven years and 11 months because no physical evidence on the guy that polluted our last name. Mm -hmm. What he said, I did. So I said, okay, well, if I take this these two keys and go at home, figure speech, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna go to trial for 1,500, 3,000 keys. So, so all three of y'all <clears throat> cop please. Mm -hmm. No. No? No, no, no. It's called, so, like I may mention, we set precedents and mm -hmm. everything we did. So it's called conditional plea. 
So we didn't take no plea talking about what we did, how we did, nothing. The federal government blatantly just told us, look, somebody's going to jail. Make your mind up how y'all gonna do this. You're gonna, this is the time you're getting, this is the time, so the conditional plea or con conditional agreement is just saying, I agree to take the time. <clears throat> With, I reserve two rights to fight my case as if I went to trial. Exactly. And, and, and like I just said, it's in the book, so you can read that. We reserve the right to fight our case as if we went to trial. So it's not like, yeah, okay, um, I'll take this 97 months. What did you do? I did absolutely nothing. Well, you know I could take back this plea. I mean, well, you have to do what you have to do. Like, I can't tell you I did something I did nothing. So when, when you understand, and this is for everybody <coughs> just watching, right? And this is not to throw nobody under the boat, nothing like that, or under the bus, you know. But when you take a plea, you have to tell what you did, what your role was, mm -hmm. and with who, mm -hmm. right? And so, like I may mention, we had a conditional plea. Our plea was just as simple as you agree to take this time. So you don't have to implicate nobody and else, right? Implicate and it's to reserve the right to continue to fight the case. Actually, the um, U.S. Attorney Carmen Glenn, she was pregnant, going through the, the through the um, even through the hearings. We didn't even go to trial. Even going through the hearings, she started having a bad pregnancy, started losing hair, and she like, I just can't do this no more. What do y'all think is fair? Take this and y'all just go ahead and now leave the door open for y'all to still fight your case. It's in the book. And I say that because it sounds like something far-fetched, but it's in the book. Okay, let's talk about, you, you guys take your conditional plea. Did anybody besides the three brothers, we don't have to say names, get more time than no. the three brothers? Mm -hmm. No. So the 32 in total, so three Less brothers time. is 29 well, it was, left. It was, so in our case, you know, because they break cases up, mm -hmm. right? So collectively it was what? Nine of us, 10 of us, and we all got time in that range from 222 months as low as 97 months. Lower than that? Yeah, 60 we, months. We had three that got lower than that. <clears throat> and it's because he feds go by the capability. Your culpability in the role you played in said conspiracy. So what they weeded out, oh, you really didn't do too much or you didn't do too much. You came in the conspiracy here in the in the conspiracy at this time, according to wiretaps. So there's not much they they go by guidelines, federal, federal sentencing guidelines. So there's not much they can give you if the records are shown, regardless of what anyone said, can't go beyond this. But I just keep in mind again, we was all facing three life sentences. And our judge at the time, Judge Solomon Blot, right, mm -hmm. said. I, I'm telling you now, y'all mess with me, take this to trial or whatever, I guarantee you I'm going to give you every bit of three life sentences. And we just like, do what you're going to do, you know? And, you know, we fought the government tooth and nail. And they had never seen this, like, South Carolina is one of the most Confederate states. Is that where all three of y'all were caught? Same? We never no, got we caught. We got extradited. Yeah, we got, we got extradited. extradited. Yeah, yeah. Like, we right. never been really to South Carolina. Okay. You know, but South Carolina was a state that agreed under federal jurisdiction to pick up the case. And it's Fourth Circuit. Fourth Circuit is the most Confederate circuit. In the Fourth Circuit, you have Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. That's the Fourth Circuit, the most Confederate circuit out. They still openly and willingly fly the Confederate flag, and they still have Jim Crow law intact, and they believe in the good old boy system. How old were y'all when you got caught? I think I just turned When you 30, started your I think I just turned 33. I had to be 34. So 34. Wow. Yeah. So y'all are still very, very Listen, young men. Maybe from out there. Yeah, but no, still, <laughs> when we yeah. talked about the 60s, they were <laughs> yeah. <they're> done. <laughs> yeah. But... Here, so 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 let's talk about the transformation. Yeah. Did y'all come from a religious background? No. I know y'all are born. Now we went to like. Let me rephrase that. So of course, you know, as kids, you know, 
Easter, everybody went to church, mm -hmm. you know, or Christmas, you know, you went to church for the Christmas plays or whatever. But like it that. wasn't but for every no, Sunday, no, no, not at all. Mamas is 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 toting around this Bible. No. Y'all got to come to church with me. Nothing no. about the okay. important of the Word of God. And, and no Bible in the house. Okay, so there's a couple of points I want to touch on. Mm -hmm. Y'all are born again Christians, and mm -hmm. you have been very, very forthcoming and really open to share this with our audience. Mm -hmm. How does the King of Kings, mm -hmm. number one, and maybe this played into it, you got people like Kenneth McGriff, mm -hmm. Supreme, uh, Fat Cat Nichols, mm -hmm. Life Sentences. Mm -hmm. Life sentence. I don't believe at that time, Preem was locked up for life. But y'all are doing seven years, 10 years, 11 years. Did Was that the wake up call for you to say, look, we dodged. God got a bigger plan for us here. Exactly. So it actually happened before that because for anybody to tell you, right, mm -hmm. that in the midst of fighting for your life, you don't look to a higher power, they lie to you, right? So in the midst of fighting for our life, we knew we couldn't stand on our own strength, no matter how strong we was, and we strong, but we was like, okay, <laughs> somebody gonna have to help us with this. And so, you know, some people turn to, you know, the religion of Muslim, some turn to Christianity, you know, some turn to God body, becoming a five percenter, some become FOI, you know, but everybody, you know, seeks a higher power. It just so happened that our higher power just happened to be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. So in, in all actuality, right, because, you know, you're asking to paint the picture, we're going into prison, you know, for less or better terms, we're using um, an Italian quote, you know, we made man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But we was always trendsetters. We were trendsetters. So we were leaders. And we did understand that we were leaders. And we knew no matter what we did, we had to lead righteously because we got a flock of people coming behind us. And we didn't treat nobody like they was a crash dummy. So as you heard Todd said earlier, we're not going to lead nobody to a cliff and watch them fall off. You know what I'm saying? So... Understanding, you know, a term that I used earlier, real men do real things, you know, and sometimes just being a man is understanding that we're vulnerable and that we have to understand that, yo, damn, I can't figure this out by myself. Because when you're fighting the feds and they got, as I may mention, we've been on their radar since 1979. So they've been doing investigations, shutting down, doing investigations, new investigations, and they bring in all that investigative transcript, paperwork with them. And so when you got a lawyer that comes to you and put your transcripts in front of you, and it happens to be stacked this high off the ground to go from here to the wall, right? You got to read all that shit. And now you got to make heads and tail out of it because it's up to you to help defend yourself. Because mm -hmm. your attorney is just a mouthpiece. And to them, it's a game, you know, because the judge, the prosecutor, and the attorney all go to school together, right? So you have to read that. And so in reading that, now you need understanding for it. And you need to be able to be able to pull out what's factual and what's lies and how to identify it and then use it, you know, as a tool to help your case. So our whole case was really kind of built on a lot of lies. You know, was we guilty of some shit? Hell yeah. You know, but not none of the stuff they had us for. And that's why we were so adamant. Nigga, we'll go down fighting. There are actually <coughs> some people in jail right now, actually, and no one wants to believe this, but there are some innocent people in jail. Now, for that actual case, were we innocent? Yes. Was we guilty of a lot of other stuff? Of course. But not for that particular case. So we have went down fighting, period. And so now understanding that, and we got all of these transcripts in front of us and all of this discovery, it's like, Lord, somebody help me understand some of this stuff. So that's when you begin to search a, how, a higher power.
And in doing so, now you're communicating with other folks who are in the same type of situation. In South Carolina, they were hanging people. So much time is astronomical time. And, and me and you in the same cell, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm saying to you, Sean, and you like, yo, man, my lawyer gave me all this paperwork, man. Shit. I ain't, I'm like, yo, Sean, you got to read that, man. But you take it and just throw it in the garbage. And I'm like, Sean, that's your life you throwing in the garbage, man. You know, man, later for that, you know, I, I love the Lord and I'm serving the Lord. Yeah, but the Lord says, faith without works, right? So part of your work is reading that transcript. And God will give you the understanding right? And the clarity that you need to pull out the lies, the inconsistencies, and point them out and use them for your defense. But if you throw that away, you're throwing away your life. And so it's conversations start like that. And people started saying like, wow, you know, once you get saved and things become revealed to you and God starts opening things up to you, you know what I'm saying? So us, you know, making the transformation that we did, we were trendsetters anyway, and we wasn't afraid to be different. And you, you already heard parts of that, you know, how could you be in a game where it's mayhem and death and this and that, and y'all loved and revered? We were different. We cut from a certain cloth, and there's not too many people cut from that cloth. <clears throat> people look at us and say like, damn, you know, you made kind of, you know, marks on the things like, what? What year you said? And then you start doing the math and saying, well, how old are you? Yeah, we different. Mm -hmm. We different. And that's not, <clears throat> no yeah. disrespect to anybody, and that's not being flamboyant, and just, we just different. L let me ask you, because I want to get to the King of Kings Foundation. Please. Y'all speak about your mother. She has been a constant in this conversation since the very beginning. Your mother, Alice. Mm -hmm. I'm sure y'all broke her heart Only in God. a million pieces. Only God knows. Did, is she still alive? And if not, did she live long enough to see her boys transition? Yes. So to answer the question, um, yeah, of, of course, we broke my mother's heart, you know. Um, and my mother's a different person too, you know, like she's cut from a different cloth also, you know, because when you come in from Harlem, you know, in those, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s era, you know, shit was different, mm -hmm. you know. So she's cut from a, you know, unique cloth also. But of course we broke her heart, but my mother lived long enough to see me and Todd come home, um, change our lives. She used to come and sit in the audience with us when we was going into schools or whatever. And when we used to be sitting there talking to the kids, our scholars, we used to say, listen, don't take this shit for granted what we're saying. Our mom is sitting right there. You know, so yeah, she had a chance to <coughs> see us change our life. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a thing that I share, um, and, and it's facts. And had we known it felt this good to do the right thing, we'd have been doing it a long time ago. Mm. Long yeah. time ago. So, so in a nutshell, my mother had the opportunity to truly watch us grow from boys to men. Even at the age of 30 and 40 or what have you, she watched her kids grow from boys to men because not only did she hear about the transformation through phone calls from the prisons, but she sat in the audience and she, she saw it. She so she was able to leave here with peace in her yes, heart, knowing that definitely. the boys she raised yeah. to be decent young men yes. finally I come from, young man. There you go. <laughs> yes, okay, definitely. talk to me about your foundation, King of Kings. So, we both, you know, like individually made conscious decisions. There's no way we're going to go home the same way we came back in here, right? So, the things that we're doing with our organization, we just didn't start doing when we came home. We were doing while we was in prison. In prison, I was a GED tutor. Mm -hmm. I was responsible for helping over 75 inmates get their GED. And Todd's, you know, prospective prison where he was at, yeah. he'll share with you, he did a lot of different things too, right? Um, coming home, you know, we wanted to tell our story, right? And, you know, a lot of things was happening, so we really wanted to do a movie, right? And um, an individual said, hey, look, it's two roads to accomplish that, right? 
Either you do, you write a book or you do a documentary. We chose the latter, we did a documentary. At the same time, we said, listen, we wanna make sure that our future leaders don't fall into the same traps we fell into. Even though we made our choice knowingly and willingly, it was still a trap. We just didn't realize it then, right? So we wanted to go into schools and start speaking to kids. And so Todd set up the first school that we went into. And we went in and, you know, um, just, you know, out of sure, you know, passion to, you know, to bring about change. We saw that we were impactful. Right? And we saw that, yeah. wow, we can make a difference. Right? And then we was going into schools and we realized, we said, hold on, we need a little more structure than just going into schools and just talking to kids, you know. Of course, we were passionate about it, you know, um, but we had to get educated about it. Right? And by, at that time, we had already started working on King of Kings documentary, you know. I'm just kind of, you know, talking about the history of Jamaica, Queens, how it went from Queens to becoming a forerunner in everything from the industry to fashion, you know, to the streets, you name it, right? Because with a lot of the majors, you mm -hmm. know, we just named some of the street entrepreneurs. But when you look at the industry, and you start looking at huge. Russell Simmons, you yep. start looking at all of the different rap groups, even on down to Nicki Minaj or 50, mm -hmm. 50 Cent and all these different people now. You know what I'm saying? When you start looking at retail and you look at FUBU mm -hmm. and different people that come, you know, you look at musicians, you know, like so it's so many and so many basketball players, athletes and come out of Queens, mm -hmm. right? So that's, we wanted to talk about, you know, how phenomenal Queens was and the role that we played in history of Queens, going from Queens to now being a force to be reckoned with, right? And so with that being said, we said, okay, we got the documentary, King of Kings. So we might as well now form an organization, a foundation under King of Kings. And so a lot of folks thought, you know, that it was in resemblance to our Lord and Savior, who is the King of Kings. No, it was just a title that was given to us because that's where the name came from, King of Kings, right? And now it takes on a whole different thing because yes, if you want to say it's, you know, you know, connotation to our Lord, yes. But then it wasn't, you know, it was just named after that documentary. It was like a catchy name, King of Kings, you know, and we happened to be the King of Kings, so that's what we're gonna roll with. And so we started the foundation just wanting to make a difference, just yeah. helping our youth recognize the stumbling blocks and the pitfalls and the traps that are out there. So we developed our mission, which was to educate all to the dangers and consequences of being involved with drugs, guns, gang violence, succumbing to peer pressure. But most importantly, we promote the importance of an education because we know the lack of could lead to homelessness, poverty, and incarceration. And then one of our strongest goals was to help build stronger, safer, closer communities because that's the structure we were brought up in, you know? And so we started developing and putting structure to it and we developed our anti-drug, anti-gang warriors talk. And that's a tour that we've offered to schools where we offer a series of workshops dealing with topics like gang awareness, anger management, the hidden dangers of drugs, what to do if you ever stop by the police, you know, bullying. Um, I mean, it's, it's a host of them, domestic violence, you know, and we started developing that. Then we got into mentoring, you know, and it just, you know, we became vendors with the Board of Ed. You know, we became motivational, inspirational speakers, you know, because still we knew that the message we wanted to share is bigger than just Queens and New York, right? So then we started traveling the nation. And we're also tied into like seven different speaking bureaus. Mm -hmm. You know, um, not that that amounted to anything, you know, but we One wanted time. the message. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted the message to get out there, yes. you know. Um, and even like we got the message out because people thought when we did our documentary that we was going to glorify this past history. You know, but we didn't. You know, all we did was we wanted to expose the government, you know, the federal government for what they really were, that they would go to any extent to get an indictment against you and lock your ass up and throw the key away for real. And so we wanted to wake everybody up to that. Like, listen, don't be blind to this. This is what's going on, you know? And so, you know, the, the foundation was formed like 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago. And it just morphed. Yeah. <clears throat> and 
I have to share this before time runs out because before time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to, from New York and beyond to truly understand. First and foremost, right here in New York, there's a guy called 45 that has a presidency on the end of his name. What he just did in New York two weeks ago, mm. so I pray you people understand this. Mm. He enacted the federal government into New York cases. So anyone with a gun or a drug case. Or a gang charge. Or a gang charge. The feds is picking your case up because Donald Trump said he is seeking stiffer penalties. Now, mind you, this is New York. New York is trendsetters. We caused the domino effects of it start here. Rest assured, it's going to be in your neighborhood also, or even your state. Right. So one thing about us, we're not here to tell nobody what to do or how to do. All we want to do is appeal to your intellect, give you something to think about, and make you go, hmm. Because ultimately, the choice is yours. You can hear whatever we're saying, and at the end of it, go, damn what they're saying. But at least you could never say no one didn't tell you. And we always tell folks, there are choices, consequences, and something at stake. You have a choice to make. And once you make that choice, there's consequences, and there's something at stake. And a lot of times, that stake is lives. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and the decision, <clears throat> excuse me, the decision belongs to the receiver. So I hope all of you have your ears open. Remember, we were your age, you're never ours. There's no right way to do it wrong. Don't get caught up in the myth, the myth of you're untouchable because we thought we were. And, and, and for all of you young G's, yo, know, stay off of social media, man. You know, tell stop talking about, yo, look at this, this or that. Yo, we over here at this party. You telling the ops where you at. You, you know, you just giving them too much information. And as Todd made mention, he didn't, if he didn't say it clearly, I'm going to say it. Vote. Vote, vote, vote. If you're legal and you're able to vote, go out and vote because your life depends upon it. It might seem like we're just talking half-heartedly. No, literally, your life depends on it. Check, I'm trying to remember the exact number on the executive order, right? But slavery is written back into law. Of course. So y'all need to check this, man. Of course. It's, well, I'm going I'm to collaborate on that just a little. It's written back into law by President Barack Obama. Oh, no, he didn't. Yes, he did, and I'm glad he did, because the law states that if in time of need, every American citizen can be used in the form of modern-day slavery, free labor. Not He didn't leave room for a 45 to say, oh, if this happens, because it ha this vote, this thing came up. If, if the guy 45 in office now, but it came before his desk, he just said, oh, I got you blacks again. I got you Spanishes. I got you. I got you. President Obama said, no, this is affect every American citizen. So I thank you for that, President. And that is my president. So, you know, man, listen, man. As Maid mentioned, you heard it through the whole interview, man. We love life, man. Not just ours, everybody's, man. <clears throat> and we want everybody to be mindful, man. You know, this corona shit is real. You know, um, you know we're sitting here. We got our masks off right now, but we got our masks right here, man. We got our masks. Yeah. So we need y'all to stay safe, man. Stay masked up. Social distance. Sanitize your hands. You know what I'm saying? Don't take nothing home to your people, you know, because you feel you extinct or you above it. Um, again, yo, listen, vote, vote, vote. Like your life depends on it, because it does. Absolutely. And I, I'll leave you with this, man. There's two type of people in this world, man. And you know, like, I'm a firm believer, whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve it, right? But there are two types. One that believes he can, and one that believes he can't. Hmm. Guess what? Both of them are right. Which one are you? Fellas, I can't thank y'all enough for your time. Y'all dropped a lot of gems. And um, I think your biggest advantage is you're credible. It's one thing for a person like myself or so many of the people out there who have a good heart and want to do good right. to walk in and talk to individuals. But it's not the same because we're not coming in with the same background and the same level 
of genuineness. I've done this Mm -hmm. and I can talk to you because I have been exactly where you're at. So I thank you for that. And I also thank you if y'all didn't get anything else accomplished in this interview. People think being a man, bravado, I'm in the streets. That's showing my toughness. That's showing I'm cool. Y'all are saying, no, you can be just as cool being God-fearing, yes. doing the right thing, being lovers of life. So thank y'all very much for your time. And um, on the behalf of the Vlad TV audience, we appreciate y'all and we look forward to working with y'all again. And listen, man. Blessings. Blessings. That's Tar said, man. We thank you, man, Sean, for having us, man. Um, you know, for even think that, you know, we have something to share. Um, we're humbled, man, and, and we appreciate, you know, you and your platform, um, you know, to even think that the Fatalo Brothers got a word that we can share, man. So thank you for having us, man. And, you know, you know, for the youngest out there, man, just know, man. Like you said, you know, and it came it from you. It's two ways, it's brother. No one, it's not too many more credible than us. You know what I'm saying? And this ain't no made up shit. We ain't sitting here making up no stories. No, it's documented. Yeah. It's documented, man. And we're going to keep it 100 with you. You heard me say in this interview, what we doing right now is more gangster than what shit we ever could have did, right? Because right now we are direct threat to a system, a fabric that's been in place for 400 years, right? And that's a, a system of oppression and depression, right? And imprisonment, right? You heard Todd say cheap manual labor, a form of modern day slavery. We for our people. We are against genocide. We don't care what shape, form, or color comes in. We're against genocide. We don't care if you put the gun in your hand. We don't care if you put the drug in your hand. We don't care if you put in, standing in front of that man with the black dress on talking about, we did it. We are against that. We are pro-life, man. And so you hearing it live and direct, real men do real things. Stand up and man up. And on that note, We love you. We don't know how to unlove you.